Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this webinar today about street lighting in municipalities. Our, our presenters today are Ken Fellman, Paul Vessel, and Dave Zelenok. Before we get started, I do want to let you know that our uh, our webinar is being recorded and the presentation materials will be posted on the CML website at www.cml.org under training materials by the end of this week. If you are unfamiliar with the GoToWebinar platform, you should see a control panel on the top right of your screen. There's an orange arrow to the left of the box, or to the panel, excuse me, and uh, that orange arrow will minimize the entire box. All participants have been muted for the webinar, but we encourage you to ask questions by typing them into the question box. Uh, we'll hold a Q&A near the end as time permits from the webinar, so please feel free to type these questions as you think of them throughout the presentation. One last note is that we are currently creating a resource page for topics related to equity and diversity on our website at www.cml.org slash equity. We would love to have additional contributions to this page. And if your municipality has created something that you'd like to share with us, uh, please send us an email. At this time, I'd like to hand things over to Dave, who will be our first presenter. Well, Courtney, uh, thank you very much. And uh, Courtney, thanks to CML for uh, being such a gracious host and sponsor of these uh, series. Hopefully everybody's having a nice lunch today and uh, enjoying some sunshine after such a, a kind of miserable last couple of days or so. So uh, there we go. I'd just like to talk today. Sorry about the slide control thing. There's a little delay. There we go. Uh, so, so I'd like to introduce just very briefly uh, 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 at the bottom of the list, who will be last in our lineup today, Ken Fellman. Uh, I like to call him the man, the myth, and the legend. Uh, he's got 36 years of experience in local government utility telecommunications practice. He's a member. He's huge. He's a Metro Cities Attorneys Association, uh, former president of NATOA, the National Association of Telecommunications Officers and Advisors. And by the way, uh, I'll just put a shameless plug in. NATOA is a great group if you're looking to, to connect with other like-minded uh, cities uh, in this industry. Uh, and Ken has also served as municipal county attorney. Uh, city council member, and uh, yes, it's uh, uh, hard to believe, uh, mayor of Arvada uh, for quite a few years. So, uh, Ken, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Paul Vessel uh, with Real Term Energy, uh, 25 years of uh, leading municipal infrastructure and energy efficiency projects. Uh, uh, Paul incredibly has led, uh, I, I can hardly scarcely believe this is true, 50, yes, 50 street light municipalization projects across four states, uh, many of them I know up in New England. Uh, and uh, we're delighted to have Paul join us here now in Colorado uh, from the beautiful town of Leadville, uh, up in the mountains. Uh, he's former CEO uh, of uh, two great companies and has done some renewable energy and efficiency uh, work as well. And he's currently the Rocky Mountain Regional Director for Real Term Energy. So Paul, welcome and good morning, good afternoon to you as well. And then last and uh, arguably least, uh, I'm Dave Zelenok. Uh, I've got uh, way too many years in Colorado local government I've been public works director of both of Colorado Springs and of a small city called Centennial in the Denver Tech Center area. Uh, I've overseen across a couple of different jobs about 30,000 Colorado municipal streetlights. Uh, and uh, related to that, as you'll see here, uh, I've done quite a few hundreds of miles of municipal fiber optics, traffic signals by the hundreds, and smart city infrastructure. Uh, I've done some work with APWA and uh, I've also uh, uh, had a nice term being an engineering faculty instructor at the Air Force Academy. So again, uh, welcome Paul, Ken, and Courtney, thanks to you and CML for uh, setting this up. Uh, very briefly, uh, uh, as they'd like to say, tell them what you're going to tell them, and then tell them what you need to tell them, and tell them what you told them. So on the tell them what we're going to say, uh, the agenda is a very brief history, uh, talk about some legal issues and challenges. That's uh, Ken's uh, sweet spot, really. Uh, I'll give a little overview of streetlights as a strategic asset and talk about how they can be a gateway to a smart city and that'll be a nice segue into what Paul will talk about which is really uh, uh, you can municipalize these things and uh, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier he's done now with more than 50 cities municipalizing them and uh, minimize, minimizing in many cases the, the cash outlay that cities need to put into these things and talk about opportunities and of course next steps and the way ahead. So. That's our agenda for today. Uh, should take uh, uh, just under an hour. I think total, we've got about 38 total slides. Uh, why is this important to your city? And by the way, on the right there, you may see a, a picture I took 
uh, what I would well, like to call a poorly maintained street light. If yeah, if you look real closely, there's a street light luminaire. It's a cobra head, a high pressure sodium cobra head sticking out of that uh, beautiful tree uh, uh, here, not too far away. Uh, but the current situation is uh, a good rule of thumb per 1,000 street lights and a typical city of about 100,000. So if that helps you some, 100,000 population city may have about 5,000-ish street lights. Uh, some have four, some have seven, but uh, but a good rule of thumb is about a thousand lights. I know Golden and Greenwood Village, we've done some work with them uh, in street lights. Uh, they've each got about a thousand lights. Uh, so if you don't know how many lights you have, that's not always an easy number to obtain. Uh, but a good rule of thumb is about $250,000 per year per 1,000 lights. And by the way, that usually does not include the replacement for a knockdown, uh, a corrosion related replacement, uh, doesn't include area lighting like in ball fields, traffic signals and that does not include LED system upgrades and new installations. So a good rule of thumb is probably about a quarter million dollars per 1,000 lights. Uh, some of the issues that we see very often now are that cities have a very limited ability to uh, change them due to aesthetic concerns. Some like high ones, some like old fashioned ones, uh, but aesthetic concerns, uh, very often there are issues and concerns about repair, maintenance, operation levels, responsiveness. Hey, I've had a burned out light in front of my house. Uh, uh, for quite a while, it takes a while in terms of uh, maintenance to get out there. Energy goals of uh, the HPS, high pressure sodium lights, were invented, believe it or not, uh, 80 years ago, back in the 1930s. And um, uh, opportunities for innovating, uh, P3s, and Paul, as I mentioned, will talk about that, and system upgrades and repurposing the infrastructure. Bottom line is, is that, uh, that, that we see this, uh, this, this municipalization initiative that's really sweeping the country as an opportunity in some cases to convert your streetlights. Uh, they are definitely now a must pay cost uh, and uh, uh, A, to reduce the cost. And uh, we'll talk here about there's the potential, uh, talking long term, uh, to even turn many of those streetlights into a revenue source uh, versus a must pay cost. Uh, and then there are some related broader issues related to telecommunications. We'll talk about small cells, smart city initiatives. Those are all pretty much imminent. Uh, a good rule of thumb is if you're paying a quarter million dollars now, uh, it's not unusual to see those costs reduced down to about $100,000 or conversely, a cost savings of a little over 50%, about 150,000-ish, again, per 1,000 lights is a good rule of thumb. Uh, and uh, just in terms of an executive overview, uh, many uh, Colorado uh, Street, uh, uh, the, within Colorado here, there are really three kinds of power companies. You probably know this already. There are the Munis, uh, the Colorado Springs Utilities, CSU, is the largest, actually the largest uh, full service municipal utility in the nation. But uh, there's about, I think, 25 or 30 of those. There's likewise about 25 to 30 co-ops. Um, and uh, there's, there's just a smaller number of IOUs or investor owned utilities. Uh, and a good rule of thumb, again, the numbers do vary quite a bit, um, uh, about $20 per street light per month for typical light. Uh, and of that number, by the way, uh, about $16 a month does not go into power. Conversely, about 2 to $4 a month of that 20 bucks that you're paying goes into power. That's typical for an HPS. If you convert to an LED, you can reduce that number by about half. So you're paying you know, $1 to $2 for an LED power out of 20 bucks that you're paying the power company. So uh, the point is there about 80% of the money that you're putting into a streetlight does not go in to actually buying the power for, or buying the energy for the lighting itself. As a result, many Colorado cities are now looking at municipalizing their lighting. Uh, there are some new tariffs. In fact, I'll, I'll put a, a shameless plug in for Ken. Uh, Ken worked long and hard uh, through the PUC to come up with a new tariff, as it's called, uh, which is now called the energy only rate. And he'll talk more about the great work he's done there, but you can now pay separately for the energy if you purchase or you, muni you, you municipalize uh, uh, those lights that you own there. Uh, and then Paul, as I said, we'll talk about P3s and some what I like to call alternative constructs uh, that Realterm uh, is able to bring here, as are some other companies. Uh, a good rule of thumb for an ROI is uh, three to six years. It varies. We've seen some five years. We've seen some eight years. It uh, really depends. Uh, interestingly, uh, if you're looking at an ROI on just the LED conversion by itself, uh, a good rule of thumb, as I said earlier, is an LED conversion will save you about a dollar per month in power savings, going from, let's say, $2 in power to $1 in power. And uh, if you're looking at saving a buck a month and you have a $200 per luminaire replacement cost and you're saving $1 per month, that's a 200-month 
uh, ROI on just an LED conversion. Also, I would caution you, look very, very carefully at, at any power companies uh, uh, or co-op suggestions that uh, they can save you money by doing an LED conversion. Uh, there, are, there, there are some numbers you would be happy to speak offline to you about there. So the bottom line is really is there are some, some significant cost savings possible. You can repurpose those street lights, and we'll talk about that. Uh, you can do all kinds of crazy things with them. And, and here's the hard part to believe that uh, we'd like to advise a lot of our municipal clients that the conduit itself can be more valuable than the street light uh, fixture, the mast, as you see there, or the luminaire. The conduit can be even more valuable. Uh, a good rule of thumb is 20 bucks a foot. I was talking to, a, to an engineer in downtown Colorado Springs that says, Dave, uh, price for conduit in downtown Colorado Springs now to get across, this was Nevada Avenue, 100 bucks per linear foot. And if you own the conduit, uh, there's arguably a $100 per linear foot value in taking control of maybe a $1,000 uh, street light from A to B. So uh, why bother with all these things? Well, the reasons really do vary. Uh, cost savings, as I mentioned, uh, I put it at the top of the list, but it may, it may not be the most important consideration. Uh, there are some limited but new revenues coming your way. We'll talk about that from 5G and using those as platforms for transmitters, small cell transmitters. Uh, sustainability, you're saving energy. Uh, uh, sensor platforms, uh, utility metering, we've got a slide on that I'll touch briefly on. Uh, fiber optics, uh, and you can see a picture there on the right uh, of a uh, street light with a transmitter up in Vail, where they're now putting fiber optic cables into those things and uh, the transmitters. Uh, telecommunications, property values, uh, many studies have shown that if you convert your city and you have a gigabit city, uh, it's not unusual to see a 3% increase in property values due to uh, uh, gigifying your city. Aesthetics and then new development. So, Real quickly here, I think I've got about four more slides, folks. So uh, we'd like to think that streetlights are keys to a larger strategy uh, through municipalization. Uh, traffic signal fiber interconnection is often related uh, on the traffic signal side to streetlights and the same fiber that, uh, that goes into your traffic signals can also now be leased uh, through your street lighting infrastructure. The conduit, as I mentioned, it can be highly valuable. Small cells, we'll talk about those with a brief slide here. Are they friends? Are they foes? It doesn't matter. They're coming, and you can't say no to those folks. Uh, we like to encourage uh, cities to look at fiber optic plans in conjunction with these and, and smart city strategies and trying to future-proof uh, your cities, all very important parts. Uh, in terms of uh, tech trends, what we're seeing uh, and, and often asked, hey, it's just a street light, right, or is it? And we like to think, no, actually, those masks that we call street lights today are really now seen more as uh, cash cows for platforms. Uh, uh, lots of technologies. We talked to Breckenridge. We've done some work with them. Suggest that they look at in the evenings dimming the streetlights. Uh, I mentioned 5G. It's a great platform for those. Uh, signage, wayfinding. I won't go through all these. My favorite one, those uh, toward the bottom above environmental sensors, is drone launch platforms. Uh, a lot of police and, and agencies who like to have drones put birdhouses up in conjunction with streetlights, and they are launching drones off these streetlight masts. What a great place because they've got power, they've got light, uh, and they've got great locations. So there's all kinds of different things. Great ideas, wonderful things you can do with uh, with streetlights these days. Uh, the difficulty is, unfortunately, uh, if you don't own them, they're effectively all prohibited. Uh, most likely, the power companies or the co-ops will prohibit you from doing any of these great innovative things with your street lighting infrastructure. So that's arguably a very good reason to look at municipalizing them. Uh, real briefly here, here's a picture I took up in Vail, Colorado. This is uh, uh, on the Vail Village side of it. It's a, it actually, this, these have been replaced now with a more up-to-date, better-looking uh, fixture. But uh, Vail has worked out an intergovernmental agreement with some of the telecoms up there. It's not broadband, so it's not 25 megabits. It's, uh, this is just a, a snapshot of my cell phone. Now, this one's throwing out about 4 megabits per second. Uh, it's not very fast, but, it, uh, but they are transmitting across I think uh, uh, all three cellular providers are now broadcasting off these uh, these hybrid street lights, fiber, and uh, small cell locations in downtown Vail. Uh, talking about small cells, you know, 5G probably won't exist widely for a few more years. Uh, it, it, they will require, and a good rule of thumb is two for one. Every one street light uh, will probably be outnumbered twofold by small cell transmitters at full deployment. Will be excellent platforms uh, and. Uh, unlike Ken, who studied uh, law, I only studied the laws of physics, and uh, depending on the frequencies and things, uh, the laws of physics requires, depends on how much uh, the throughput you're doing, but about a 300-foot spacing is not unusual. Uh, on the lower left here, here's a little picture 
a graphic. Uh, this is actually Thornton, Colorado, uh, a, a great city and a client of ours. Uh, uh, and every green dot, red dot, and yellow dot, if you can see there, is a location that our engineers uh, just did a random, just just a, a, a get acquainted example of what would the density look like. And sure enough, uh, uh, if you, that at full deployment with 5G, uh, and by the way, uh, not all uh, 5G is created equal. Some carriers are uh, giving you 5G and call it, giving you 50 megabits and calling it 5G. Some carriers, I just saw one this morning in downtown LA, it's uh, the, the guy got 2.3 gigabits per second. So anywhere from 50 to 2,000 uh, in terms of megabits per second is what 5G is being defined as. And depending which carrier and which tower you're looking at, uh, you can get vastly different uh, layouts. But the bottom line is, is that at gigabit speeds, which most companies are working toward, and this may take several years, as I said, uh, you're looking at about a 300 foot distance. And just a rough rule of thumb here, uh, that means you need about 100 plus small cells per square mile. Yes, it's 100 small cells per square mile. Uh, that means you'll probably have two times as many small cells as street lights. And if you're in the public works business, as I was for many years, uh, that means probably one or two street cuts per tower. Uh, and if you're charging a thousand bucks per street cut, you need to be positioning yourselves to make sure that you don't subsidize all the street cutting that's about to be going on. Uh, and then Ken can actually talk more uh, more in detail about the, the potential revenue sources. But the FCC has what they call a safe harbor rate. You can charge about 250 bucks per tower. So if you have 100 buck or 100 towers per square mile, this potential revenue at full deployment, uh, if every street light gets lit up with a with a 5G transmitter of $25,000 in revenue per square mile per year. Again, that won't happen for a while, and we don't recommend you do this based on those revenues to come. But when you look at the, the physics and the numbers where they're going, that's kind of what, what we're suggesting. Uh, the last concept I'd like to just throw out here is that a lot of these power companies are now including in their power meters fiber optic provisions or ports. And so if you're upgrading to your city that owns a utility, you may have an automatic meter reading AMR system. You're probably upgrading to an AMI system that's metering infrastructure. We suggest take the extra step now if you're looking at doing an AMR to AMI upgrade, use fiber and then work that into an overall strategy where you're using street lights, fiber, and an AMR to AMI conversion. Do it all at once. Uh, repurposing your street lighting. Uh, my next to last slide here really talks about, uh, so do you, if you own pipes in the ground, uh, do you control how they're placed? Uh, did you know that uh, you can pull out the conductors, and I won't go into the details here, but there's, there's possibly room in the uh, conduits for both a, an electrical conductor and a fiber optic cable. And again, this goes back to the notion that the conduits between those street lights may be as or even more valuable than the street lights themselves. Uh, but uh, but putting uh, fiber optic cables through those street light conduits is really kind of intriguing thing that that's often being done these days. And uh, the the bottom line is the rules are changing constantly, and we do suggest strongly that uh, you get some professional help doing this. Uh, you're probably already well positioned and don't even know it. You're probably doing permitting and records and billing. You probably have bucket trucks that roll regularly. Uh, billing and customer service. You probably have a lot of things that you're already doing. So taking on very often we find taking on a thousand plus street lights is a burden, yes, but when you look at the total cost, benefits, and savings you can uh, you can reap from this, it's possibly uh, worth doing. Uh, and then lastly, I just want to kind of walk through briefly. If you are looking at doing one of these, and Ken may try to talk you out of it due to some of the details here, and uh, Paul will talk you into it uh, uh, because there's a lot of good reasons for doing it. But but the way uh, a conversion usually starts is you determine your original value. Uh, most likely, the power company puts some money into the system. 30, 40, 60 years ago, those are called construction allowances. There's usually a 35 year depreciation schedule, 40 years on the wires, 35 on the luminaires. Uh, so if you have a street light fixture that's older than 35, you can argue it's fully depreciated and has no value. Uh, you need to estimate your transition costs. Uh, uh, this is a picture on the right here of a street light luminaire, a cobra head in a hot zone, and that can be a serious issue. You don't want your people in a bucket truck up near the hot zone. Uh, you may have to put a parallel pole here and there. And then lastly, on the lower right, there is a picture of what's called a demark or demarcation point or disconnect. Uh, a good rule of thumb is they can run about a hundred bucks per street light. So that does add to your transition cost uh, because you have to have some point where you and the power company agree uh, either this individual street light or this string of street lights, the demarcation point, uh, the DMZ, if you will, 
is exactly at that point and there's some kind of a disconnect or some kind of a physical insert you'll need to put in there. You may need to con consider condemnation uh, and it may take three to five or six years or longer to look at the ROI. Uh, and again, as I said earlier, revenue generation, aesthetics and a fiber backbone are great bonuses. Those are tough to quantify and we don't recommend that you do your ROI, including those at the outset. Do a conservative approach, look at your numbers, look at your costs and uh, start down that path. So. Bottom line is, uh, can we help? We're glad to uh, uh, assist, advise, um, as I know many cities are doing right now, and do take the broader, longer, higher perspective that beyond streetlights, uh, there's there's a whole number of other reasons why and good uh, good reasons for doing this. So, well, Paul, I don't want to uh, run too long. I think we're right on schedule here at the 20 minute or one third point. So I'm going to turn uh, turn this over, Paul, to you, if I may, and Courtney uh, back at CML. If you'd like to take control of the slides and uh, pop us up into Paul's deck for the next 15 minutes or so, I'm sure he will endlessly fascinate us. So, Paul, over to you, my friend. There we go. Thank you, Dave. Again, I'm Paul Vassell, I'm head of uh, Rocky Mountain Region for Real Term Energy. And uh, I'm going to talk to you really about the underlying uh you know street light uh infrastructure you know they they dave dave worked you up from the ground and i'll take you up to up the pole to the light um as dave had mentioned the opportunity here with municipalization is to capitalize on this infrastructure which you know today may just be a street light but tomorrow it's going to be your gateway to a host of uh, services that we know about today and many of which we haven't discovered yet so, you know, here you have a depiction of a, of a streetlight pole and some of the uh, myriad of services that are, are available today. And, you know, with the, with the technologies that exist, the integration of these services have, be, have become a lot less costly than they were just two or three years ago. What's important to consider uh, when you're looking at potentially lay, layering on some of these services, and we always start with smart lighting. You know, Dave, Dave mentioned smart lighting probably 80 to 90% of the uh, 100 or so projects that we've done in the last year, year and a half have incorporated smart lighting. Smart lighting has several benefits. Um, the most important one that we're finding, and we didn't, we didn't realize this when we, when we started to deploy smart lighting, is really the ability to immediately to respond to constituents. And uh, shockingly enough, not everybody's gonna be enamored with, uh, with your LED conversion. And to have that ability, uh, you know, with, with, at the tips of your fingers, to be able to dim and trim uh, lights uh, after a constituent call is, is really is really quite a benefit. Also, you know, uh, smart controls give you proactivity when it comes to to maintenance, so uh, you don't have to visually uh, witness that a light is out, which is what we have to do today. But you'll be informed. Uh, via the network and the central management system if there are any anomalies and to be able to react to that. Of course, public Wi-Fi has become quite popular during COVID times with uh, you know, more and more people working at home and distance learning. Um, we're finding smart parking and traffic controls, another very popular um, overlay. Um, lots of affordable technology. Um, be aware as you move forward with this uh, about future-proofing it, as Dave alluded to. So uh, looking at uh, open platforms, interoperability, making sure that these uh, technologies can be monitored and, uh, and maintained. So obviously the first step in, uh, you know, all three of us, um, you know, come at it from, from our own uh, different vantage points. And that's why we're working together. Ken, from the legal standpoint, Dave, Dave's firm, HR Green, real experts on the whole infrastructure side. And we, you know, we've had the fortune, I think, of, of, of doing more of these municipalizations, uh, maybe than anybody, certainly uh, more than most in the market. So with 50 of these under our belt, we, we've learned a few things uh, along the way. And, one of those is, you know, the inventory analysis and reconciliation is really critical. Um, we have never under undertaken a project either through municipalization or otherwise where the inventory that was believed to, to be held by the utility was accurate. So getting that right is, is key. Uh, and we do, and, and, and there's no substitute for physical inventory. So going poll by poll, uh, and I'll get into that in the next slide. Making sure you get that 
accurately. Dave went over um, you know, so the buyback terms that need to be ev uh, evaluated. So uh, uh, you know, making sure you get a fair deal, uh, applying any incentives and, and tariff changes, and then making sure that you're prepared post acquisition uh, to take on that maintenance uh, that the utility is currently doing for you today. So here's, here's the foundation of any, any project, and you really want to get this right because this is going to affect uh, not only uh, the uh, accuracy uh, of, your, of your buyback and the inventory, uh, but, but gathering this information is going to make sure that you get the lighting right as you move forward. So uh, GIS field audit, um, we, use the, we use an asset management tool that you see uh, on the left, uh, if you can find another one that, that that you know can integrate with your GIS uh, system and be able to uh, carry that data through your project, which is really important. When you move from the audit to the installation uh, stage and then uh, on through commissioning and, and, and maintenance, having a, a user-friendly integrated GIS-based platform is, is, is really, really uh, valuable and important. And make sure that you're correct. Uh, you're collecting uh, the uh, the appropriate attributes. Um, you know, typically when we go through a municipality, you know, we're looking at things like uh, offset from the curb, uh, roadway classification, the height of the fixture, uh, ownership, um, uh, uh, mast arm uh, length, et cetera, et cetera. This then becomes part of your updated asset uh, uh, management database, uh, which you're now going to own uh, when you take uh, control from, from the utility. Um, and also will give you ease now of, uh, of being able to maintain uh, those assets as you move forward. This is really a, a, a big difference when you when you take a look at your options you know allowing the utility to continue to own and manage your street lights and then eventually upgrade them or to to do it yourself or have somebody like us uh, you know manage that for you lighting design is really uh, a, a big a big difference between a utility managed and upgrade and uh, and, and, a, and a municipal managed upgrade the utilities almost across the board from what we've seen, they, they do a one for one replacement. So what that means is for every wattage level, everywhere where we have a 150 watt high pressure sodium, they'll replace that with an equivalent LED. So yes, you'll have some savings, but they're not addressing the underlying um, anomalies that you and everybody else has with your current streetlight platform. You're overlit, you're underlit, you've got light trespass, light loss everywhere. Um, so if you don't apply and overlay proper photometrics, um, you're not going to address those issues. Uh, the uh, RP818, we believe, is the best guideline, and we use that as our photometric guideline. Um, as I mentioned before, we're collecting all that data in our physical audit, and then we're uh, you know looking looking thing, uh, at things like bug uh, backlighting, uplighting, and glare. And we do uh, and we recommend if you work with anybody, unique street by street uh, photometric design. Um, taking into consideration problem, problem areas, parks, um, busy intersections, et cetera, uh, all of which re require their own customized photometrics. So when you're, uh, <clears throat> when you're finished with all that, um, you should be producing a document which should be the blueprint now to move forward in your in your project. It's commonly known in the industry as the investment grade audit, and it includes all the all the critical data that you need: um, the cost savings analysis, uh, the maps, the GIS result, the photo photo uh, photometrics, um, your LED fixture selection, your, your in, in installer selection, all the ROIs. Um, uh, you know, as, as its name implies, it's an investment grade audit. So if you're looking for financing, it can be financed based on, on this document. Community outreach often overlooked. Um, if you Google problems with LED upgrades, uh, you, you'll see a, a lack or, 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 or oversight on, on community outreach. 
The type of community outreach that you opt for is quite subjective. It will depend, you know, on, on the sort of constituent interaction that, that you need to, to have uh, in your municipality. It can range from a simple uh, website update. Um, we often post FAQs, so anticipating what questions might come up and providing responses for that is great. Uh, press releases, uh, more high touch uh, would be an open house. So invite uh, stakeholders to come on in and show them what you're doing. Look, uh, we've taken into consideration dark sky um, issues. Uh, we do for every project. Um, we've, uh, uh, you know, considered um, uh, 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 Kelvin color temperature, which uh, which is a, a big issue in some uh, in some municipalities. Um, you can, if you want real tie high touch, you can give them live tracking on the installation, so access to uh, to the progress of the project as it moves from uh, GIS audit to uh, commissioning. This is a tool that uh, that we like. It, it 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 gives complete transparency. So whoever in the municipality is is um, is tapped uh, to oversee uh, the project uh, with this tool, they can see in real time uh, all the progress uh, in the installation, monitors, and uh, uh, depletion of of wiring and fusing and other elements. So you know uh, you know if you need to uh, augment inventory, any issues. Uh, a prior to job termination, it's just a it's a great uh, transparent tool to track your project as it as it moves through commissioning. And then finally, uh, commissioning, uh, we uh, strongly recommend uh, QC at, at various uh, stages. That's quality control to ensure that those luminaires and photo cells are be, are being installed uh, according to both the utility as well as the manufacturer's uh, specifications. Um, leveling is really critical when we're looking at LED uh, lighting. And you want to do that at, at various um, junctures of, of the project. So uh, at the very beginning, because you can capture mistakes before they, uh, before they, get, uh, they, uh, they get worse, uh, midway through that installation, and uh, of course, at the very end, the commissioning. And that commissioning uh, um, binder then should include everything that you need um, for maintenance, um, all of the final costs, all of the final photometric designs, um, any subsidies, and and making sure that those tariffs uh, that uh, that that Dave uh, alluded to, that Ken was so instrumental in getting changed, the energy only uh, tariffs, that those are actually implemented accurately and correctly by your utility once you move from utility ownership to municipal ownership. And then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, make sure that you have in place maintenance. If you haven't been maintaining your lights, you're gonna be looking at four key areas um, once you take ownership from, uh, from the utility. You'll wanna have an online map-based outage reporting system. Uh, this is a, a, a picture of ours that, that we use. Um, You'll want to have electric, uh, electrical contractor management. You know, be careful if you're working with electrical contractor. They're not uh, often not uh, sending their bucket trucks out uh, most efficiently. You know, you don't want one light being being uh, repaired one day and then uh, three days later another one. You want them aggregated um, uh, so your costs are are are, are managed efficiently. Efficiently, RMA um, return of merchandise. Uh, make sure on the equipment side that you're working with um, manufacturers that provide 10-year warranties. That's the standard today in the uh, LED market, both for photo cells as well as for, for LEDs. The failure rates, you've got 350,000 or so fixtures that have been operating over seven, eight years, and we're seeing an average failure rate of about 0.3.4%, which is actually less than what the manufacturers stipulate, which is 6% or point, uh, over 10 years, 0.6%. But you know there there still are failures in those photo cells, and uh, and or fixtures will will need to be replaced, and uh, somebody's got to be doing the return of merchandise authorization uh, management. And then lastly, uh, if you if you've incorporated smart controls, you'll want to uh, make sure that you've got the appropriate smart control management. Uh, most of the tier one smart control manufacturers have their own uh, central management system, uh, which will make that 
process uh, much, much easier. And then last, but certainly not least, uh, is financing. Um, you know, with COVID and, and, and budget constraints, I'm sure many of you are, uh, are, are being faced with this. You've got several different options. Um, you've got the simplest, which is a tax exempt lease, um, no capital up front, essentially the savings uh, uh, pay for those lease payments. If you want uh, less, uh, less risk, then you can move to an energy performance contract where the opera uh, operation maintenance costs are included with guaranteed savings. And then lastly, um, is the uh, 3P public-private partnership where actually a third party comes in, takes ownership and upgrades your infrastructure and operates them. Um, a leader in this field who's not with us today, but a group that we, uh, we work with is AIP, American Infrastructure Partners. And I can tell you more about them uh, if, uh, if we talk after this. And that is it. Uh, that's who we are. I'll pass it over to Ken and thank you. Courtney, tell me when I have control of the screen here. Uh, go ahead, Ken, you have control. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Now that you have heard all the wonderful reasons why you ought to own your streetlights, um, I am here to dampen your expectations. And uh, some of you have heard me speak before, uh, know that uh, sometimes I try to incorporate rock music analogies into my talk. So if I were to find the title of a song that best describes what I'm about to talk about, um, I'll show my age and go back to 1971. and quote you a song title from the incomparable Ringo Starr, It Don't Come Easy. So let's see, I'm hitting the arrow and it's not moving. Let's try that again. Okay. There we go. Um, so uh, before you go forward, uh, as uh, Paul mentioned, uh, you've got to do the inventory. And I would suggest to you, that um, first of all, my experience is exactly as his is, uh, your inventory will show that uh, whatever amount of streetlights you're being billed for, it's wrong. And you may be being overcharged. So even if you decide not to go forward, an inventory will give you um, a clearer understanding of what it is that is in your community, uh, and it will make sure that you can ensure that you're not paying for somebody else's streetlights. Um, the, um, uh, we, we've heard about the financial analysis. This is all the stuff that you've got to do before uh, you start getting legal uh, involved, but you do need to carefully study uh, your existing franchise agreement. Uh, while franchise agreements are pretty similar from community to community, there are differences. Sometimes it's based on the time that they were entered into. Sometimes it's based on uh, the nature of an individual community, but um, the provisions impacting how you acquire utility facilities um, may be treated differently from one franchise to another. And it's important that you uh, check those out and understand what obligations you have if you wanna go forward. And then it's critically important, um, and I'm probably not telling anybody anything that you don't already know, that you've gotta have your elected officials supporting this opportunity. I mean, for the most part, I think they will, um, uh, if you get their support, you, it's going to have to be at least let us go forward and analyze this and see if it's something that's worthwhile and we'll come back to you before we actually start the transaction. Um, but uh, there's a lot of lobbying that goes on. Um, some uh, utility companies are not real excited about selling streetlights, um, but they do interact uh, periodically um, on a regular basis with your mayors and council members. And... Uh, you certainly don't want your council to hear about staff undertaking this uh, effort um, from the utility in, in the context of why are you doing this? Uh, so make sure that you've got approval from the electeds before you go forward. All right, framework for, um, uh, for ownership. Uh, you know, this is pretty straightforward stuff. Um, if you do acquire ownership, Who's going to be responsible for that? Uh, do you need to create a new department, a new office within 
public works. Are you going to operate this within the context of your existing budget framework, or are you going to create it as a municipal enterprise? Um, and who's going to do the maintenance? I know a lot of the communities that have looked at this that we have worked with um, have determined that, frankly, by using the same exact contractors that XL Energy uses, um, they can still save a lot of money if they own the streetlights and are doing the maintenance basically themselves through contractors. Certainly the smaller communities are almost uh, always going to have a, a contractor because they don't have staff to, um, to be able to do this. Now, um, both Dave and Paul talked a little bit about uh, the history of uh, how we got to this point. I'm just going to give you a little bit more detail on that. Um, Aurora was one of the first cities that started looking at this. Golden uh, was the other. And in the early 2000s, um, Aurora basically asked us, hey, we pay pursuant to this tariff for our streetlights and we pay the energy costs, we pay the non-routine maintenance, we pay routine maintenance. Um, what would happen if we just owned the streetlights and all we wanted to do was uh, pay a non-metered energy only rate? And we searched and searched and searched the tariff and we couldn't find one. And we actually went down and had a meeting with the, the head of the um, electric uh, office at the PUC, electric regulatory office. And we said, where does it say in the tariff um, how much you pay if you own the streetlights and you want to just have a non-metered energy only rate? And he said, it's not in the tariff. You can't do that. Uh, and uh, you could put a meter on every single streetlight and pay that rate, but that obviously was not um, uh, feasible. Uh, so we started a process and it took a number of years uh, to advocate at the PUC for this non-metered energy only rate called today called the ESL rate. Um, uh, I appreciate the credit that I've been given for that. I'm not sure I deserve it. I think that uh, the Dave Chambers, the former public works director in Aurora, and Dan Hartman, the public works director in Golden, that you know we had to call this the Hartman Chambers ESL rate um, because uh, they spent a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of years advocating for this, and we were we were happy to help. But uh, what we ended up with was a rate uh, for municipalities that own streetlights and are not metered. Now, if you want to attach things to them that are going to use energy and pull energy from the light, now you've got to put a meter on there. But if it's just a street light, we know when it's going on, we know when it's going off, uh, we know what the hours are in the winter, the hours in the summer, it can be a non-metered rate, just like XL's owned, uh, XL owned street lights. And we now have that rate and it, and it is a significant cost savings. Um, the, part of that tariff uh, process and the negotiations involved uh, efforts by Excel to come up with a formula, a one-size-fits-all formula on what the how you would calculate the purchase price uh, in, in a streetlight acquisition. And it was terrible. Um, and it was, it was not reasonable. It was, um, didn't reflect what we felt were reasonable prices. And, and that effort was defeated, but the PUC in that decision said, you know, after we see a number of purchases go through, we might relook at this and we might come up with a standardized formula. So what happened after that was um, Golden took about eight years. Um, uh, and I just, I won't tell you, I, I had a lot more hair and it was a lot darker when we started that process. Um, but eventually they were able to close on the purchase acquisition of their streetlights. And uh, that closed in 2019. Um, following um, uh, the path that Golden laid out, Greenwood Village uh, was able to negotiate and purchase their streetlights, uh, which also I think closed later in the year in 2019. Um, I, I would tell you this, and we're gonna talk more about it in a minute or two. Uh, the, there were, when we got that tariff in place, there were also a number of rules related to the tariff that went into effect on when there is a municipal purchase, how you'd separate the streetlight assets from the rest of the electric distribution system. Uh, there were rules about streetlights that are on the wooden uh, distribution poles so that those poles will continue to have XL distribution facilities. XL did not want streetlights on those poles if the city was going to buy them. So there's a requirement for, to negotiate a certain period of time and the terms to take lights off of those poles. Um, uh, as with anything else, I think Paul has mentioned, they've learned a lot of stuff in doing 50 plus acquisitions. And I'm sure there are things he does differently today because of things he didn't know then. 
Uh, I will tell you, uh, if we knew then what we know now, um, some of the rules that became part of that tariff that was adopted in connection with the ESL rate, um, we would have done differently. And, and that's in a way why we're back at the PUC now, and we'll talk about that here um, now. <laughs> so uh, right now there is uh, what's called an, a phase two rate case that Excel has filed. Uh, every couple of years, Excel comes in with a phase one case where they uh, ask the PUC to approve uh, their total revenue requirements for going forward based upon you know, all the factors that go into that as a regulated utility and their rate of return. And then after the phase one case is approved, they do a phase two case where every single rate that they have, every service that they provide that's in the tariff uh, is submitted to the PUC and parties have an opportunity to intervene and uh, argue for changes to uh, whatever the company has proposed or what's in the existing tariff. In this particular case, uh, there are six municipalities that have intervened together with the Colorado Communications and Utility Alliance, which is the, um, uh, the Colorado chapter of NATOA, the organization that Dave mentioned earlier. And uh, basically, uh, we are raising a few different issues to try to put flexibility into the tariff on how, uh, how streetlight separations are done and whether uh, there are other ways to deal with streetlights on electric distribution poles, um, and to do it in a way that does not negatively impact uh, the company's operation, but could save hundreds of thousands of dollars to municipal taxpayers. Um, Excel not only has opposed so far making those changes in, in a very, very unique, in our experience, and, and my partner, Brandon Dittman, has probably done more PUC work than I have um, uh, in recent years, but we have never before seen XL try to oppose municipal intervention or any kind of intervention in one of their rate cases, whether it was gas or electric, based upon the argument that we didn't raise this issue in our tariff filing, so no one should be allowed to intervene and raise this issue. And it is true, they are not proposing any changes in the current streetlight tariff. And let me be real careful about how I say this because XL is a big company. They do a lot of really good things in our community. Um, they have supported Colorado communities in a lot of different ways. My own community has benefited from some of the things XL has done. Uh, despite what some people may think, I don't just walk around and bash XL all the time. But um, I will call out when they're acting in a way that I think is significantly opposed uh, in an unreasonable way to municipal interests. And in this particular case, other parties have intervened in the case and have raised issues to change parts of the tariff that Excel did not raise in its filing. And Excel has affirmatively said, we do not object to those other parties intervening. Excel has said, we object to the municipalities intervening. Why? Because we didn't raise those issues in our filing. So basically a different set of rules to try to stifle municipal interests from raising their voices in front of the PUC. Um, the administrative law judge, that's important for all of you to know. I know we have a, a, a number of people, some of whom I may not have talked about these issues before, probably many of whom. So uh, you need to know that, that in this particular case, municipal voices are attempted to be stifled by the company that we're trying to work with. And the administrative law judge has allowed us to intervene but he also has allowed Excel to come back later on in the proceeding and object to the introduction of our evidence on the merits. Um, so we may have to have this argument uh, again. Uh, we are hopeful that now that we're in the case, we'll be able to raise the issues and we'll be able, we might even be able to resolve it through a settlement. Uh, that would be the ideal situation. And frankly, uh, past experience shows that many issues in these rate cases are settled well before we get to a hearing. So we're hopeful, we're cautiously optimistic, but we wanna be real clear that um, not only do we have an objection on the merits of what we're trying to talk about, but we ha we've had an objection to even be able to talk about it. And, and that's been very disturbing and disappointing. So moving forward, um, you've gotta come up with, um, with some strategies. Um, who's gonna be on your team? Um, are you going to have somebody from the city manager's office, somebody from public works, 
uh, who's your major point of contact, uh, who from the city attorney's office, I would really suggest that you have um, your city attorney or one of your city attorneys uh, be involved. Um, if you are working with consultants to have done some of the, all the background work that needs to be done, do they need to be part of the team uh, to be involved in these negotiations? And oftentimes in our experience, for at least some of the discussions, um, yes, they do need to be part of these uh, discussions. So um, if you're negotiating with XL Energy, uh, you will be required to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, which creates unique problems for local governments because we have the Colorado Open Records Act to deal with. So uh, admittedly, a lot of what we're talking about is company proprietary. Um, we are usually negotiating in a way that is considered settlement discussions in advance of potential litigation because if we are not able to negotiate an arm's length transaction that works for both parties, uh, the municipality still has the option under Colorado law to condemn the streetlight infrastructure and, and to acquire it through eminent domain. So um, Excel has taken the position that uh, these negotiations that we're having to come up with an agreement are hopefully to avoid condemnation and therefore they come under Colorado rules of evidence 408, um, which means we're gonna keep them confident, keep all these discussions confidential. Um, you've gotta make sure that that non-disclosure agreement doesn't go too far. Right. I have signed them in connection with the negotiations we've been involved in. Many, Some of you have signed them, uh, but it's really important on the front end to look at it and make sure they're not overbroad. Um, given the time that it has taken uh, with other communities in the past, I'm hopeful that it, it won't take as long going forward. Um, but if you want to do things differently, if there are unique issues in your community um, and it's not something that the company is familiar with as having been done, say, in Greenwood Village or in Golden, uh, they may be adverse to it. So you've got to stay on top of it. These things can drag out for months and months and months. And um, somebody needs to take the lead on um, cracking the whip <laughs> to keep these uh, uh, these discussions going. And then, of course, it's important to uh, understand um, the tariffs. As I mentioned, you know, there are some things in the current tariff uh, that I wish I understood better back at the time those tariffs were initially uh, adopted. So make sure you review those and you understand uh, what you have to deal with. Um, if you are able to negotiate a purchase and sale agreement, obviously the price uh, is an issue. Uh, I have to be careful about what I say because I'm still constrained by those non-disclosure agreements from Golden and, um, uh, and uh, well, uh, I didn't work with Greenwood Village, but uh, we have a couple of other clients that have gotten to the purchase and sale standpoint, and uh, we have N NDAs uh, with them. But I, I will say this, um, Excel has taken the position, and this was um, part of the public uh, uh, filing, um, th that the way the price is determined is uh, based upon their entire streetlight inventory and average of their streetlight inventory throughout the state. That's one way to do it. Uh, I, I think if you if you were to go forward with that methodology uh, and you had your own appraiser look at it, you'd probably say this is less uh, or this is more rather than what we think the streetlights are really worth. If we were just to appraise the streetlights in our jurisdiction, um, Excel would say we think it's less than what an appraiser would come up with. And uh, therefore, maybe it's a fair compromise. But it, it may be that in your community, um, uh, an appraisal and uh, and going with just the price of these assets within this municipality is the better way to go. Uh, and, and that's a consideration that you need to think about. Um, if you do it that way, obviously you're gonna be looking at how old the infrastructure is, how much it's been depreciated. So if you're in an older community where you have a lot of older lights, uh, you're probably going to benefit from looking at the value of those assets because they're probably completely depreciated. If you're in a newer community that has a lot of new lights, um, you may end up with a higher price that way. So uh, factors to consider. Um, the two issues in the tariff that we're dealing with in in this uh, current PUC case are the next two bullet points here. Um, how do we determine the cost for separation? One of the things that the tariff requires, well, it doesn't require. Uh, it provides that a method for separating is to install a pull box near the street light and then a wire runs from that box. There's a fuse in the box and a wire runs from that box to the street light. Everything on 
One side of the box going to the streetlight is the cities, everything on the other side is the companies. There's another way to do it. You can put a fuse into the handhole at the base of the streetlight, not have a wire going underground that the city is gonna have to maintain and a pull box. The cost of doing it that way is significantly less. It has been done successfully in multiple states for sales of hundreds of thousands of streetlights throughout the country on both coasts. And, and yet we have a tariff that says, this is the way to do it. And the tariff also says the company has the option to look at other methods and to approve other methods, all right? So not, not the buyer, the company. Now, so I can't tell you exactly what happened in a particular negotiation, but let me suggest to you that municipalities that are trying to look at how to save money here um, might not need to be at the PUC right now asking for a change in the tariff if there had been an opportunity or a willingness to negotiate other reasonable methods to convert the separation. So uh, that's a, a key issue and a huge cost issue. Um, the streetlights on the distribution poles, another issue in a lot of the um, transactions that we've looked at in other parts of the country, um, it's been very easy for the company to enter into a pole attachment agreement with the new municipal owner of the mast arm and the streetlight that is now on an electric distribution pole. Um, I understand why XL would prefer not to have that, but um, again, that's a, a cost issue. If you have, if you have to buy a streetlight, pay fair market value for the streetlight, and then you agree basically to take it down and throw it in the trash within a certain period of time, and now buy yourself a new streetlight. There's another cost issue. So some of the other bullet points on here are just other issues that um, come up in uh, in a transaction. I'm not going to go through all of them because I want to make sure we have some time for questions, which reminds me, if you do have questions, there's a way for you to type them in to the uh, side panel on your screen. But uh, you know, these are all important issues that will go into uh, a transaction. Once you get that agreement done, it has to be approved by the Public Utilities Commission. In most cases, uh, the utility is going to prepare the filing, uh, but it's important to get in your purchase and sale agreement or in some other agreement, the right to review that filing and comment on it and make sure you agree with it. Now, the company is not gonna give you a hard time about that because obviously they want the city who's buying the streetlights to either jointly file or come in and say, yes, we agree with this commissioners, please grant it. They don't want an objection filed. But you got to read these things carefully. I will tell you, every time I've read them, um, we've had to change the language on how it described what the municipal process had been and what the municipal decision had been. So you've got to make sure that uh, you have a say in what that document says and that it's accurate. Um, there's a whole slew of closing documents you're going to need, so make sure you have that list done. And then remember, after the transaction, you still have that non-disclosure agreement that creates problems and and it took us a long time hopefully it won't take you a long time because golden incurred um, all the brain damage here of explaining the open records act and explaining that if we're spending x amount of taxpayer dollars to buy these street lights that number is coming out in a public meeting the council is going to talk about it they're going to consider whether it's a wise expenditure there may be other parts of the agreement that can remain confidential and we can redact them if we have to make the contract available. But the contract itself is a public document. And if we're using taxpayer dollars to buy these streetlights, um, most of this is available to the public. Um, so you're gonna have to make sure that your NDA reflects that and that uh, you address it properly uh, when you do your closing. And with that, I will wrap up. We'll see if we have any questions and um, happy to talk to any folks offline if you have follow up questions based upon the presentation. Thank you all. Awesome, thank you so much. I am gonna leave your contact information up here for uh, our attendees to be able to record that in case they're interested. Um, Ken, Tyler wanted you to know that you have an awesome sweater on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Gerald Barber is curious if uh, someone comes and does an evaluation for their town and if there's a cost affiliated. So, so when you say evaluation, is that a uh, evaluation of the streetlight network? 
Let me find Gerald in our attendees list here and unmute him. Gerald, can you go ahead and unmute? Oh, he, I'm sorry, he said yes. He did respond in the question. The box. So typically the way we work, we have a two-step process. We, we, we can conduct what's called sort of a desktop analysis where we get all the uh, the data on the inventory and the streetlight bills, and we'll and we'll do that evaluation typically at no cost. Uh, if you know if we want to go deeper, and as Ken said, it's a good idea to to know what your inventory is. Uh, go in there and do a poll by poll GIS uh, physical inventory. Yeah, yes, there is there is a cost associated with that, and uh, happy to, to discuss that offline with anybody. Yeah, and likewise, uh, uh, the, uh, the kind of assessment we do fits pretty often hand in hand uh, with what Paul's firm does. Uh, we, uh, we do uh, charge for it. Uh, sorry to say that. Uh, uh, we'd love to do it for free. Uh, but, to, but we like to think also that what you get in exchange is a uh, non-binding, very neutral, uh, very just the facts, ma'am, uh, assessment uh, of the feasibility, the pros, cons, costs, and time frame. So uh, uh, yes, there are some upfront costs involved, but we'd like to think that uh, that they can be uh, this is a very lucrative issue for these companies. They wouldn't be fighting so hard, honestly, if there weren't big money involved that they'd be losing and you could gain. So there are some benefits there involved. Uh, we think it's a, it's it's time and money well spent. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, we have one more question right now. Oh, it looks like there's a follow-up. Um, it says Crowley County has four small towns. I'll get with other mayors and see if we can maybe do a partnership to make this happen. Uh, he said he'll research and contact you. Great. Great. And from Mark, we have, it says, we are a young, fast-growing town. All of the streetlights are paid for by the developer. Excel runs and maintains the lights. Explain why Excel would or should be paid fair market value of the street lights for us to muni municipalize them. <laughs> that's that's a okay. candy. Right. I, I got I gotta say I that's gotta say this is um, I did not ask to have this question asked, but this is uh, I'm glad it was, um, and it's kind of a softball. I never understood why, in most communities, uh, development requirements, you require the developer to put in the infrastructure and then they give it to the utility. You can change your code right now. If you're a growing community, I, Thornton did this a few years ago, where they changed the code and they said, look, we're, we're gonna talk about whether we ought to buy the existing streetlights, but for the new ones, every time we have a new development, those streetlights get dedicated to the city, yep. not to the company. Once they huh. go to XL, XL now has them as an asset on their book. Um, they, you know, There's a small contribution that the tariff requires, but they basically get an asset that is worth far more than any cost to them. And, and what makes it even worse is the way the tariff is structured for non-routine maintenance. When a truck hits that light and knocks it over, or when the light just wears out, it's rotting at the base, and you get a call from the company that says, you have to replace these lights. The city pays for the new light, and then XL owns it and starts charging you for maintenance again. So it's, you know, it's a great deal if you can get it, and <laughs> They have it, so I, I can't give you a good logical reason why that's the case. But certainly, in a growing community, you may want to look at your uh, your development regulations and change that. In fact, uh, just to tie on also to what Ken said, uh, the the point I made earlier about revenue generation is about two hundred and fifty dollars per year per light that you that the FCC that's that safe harbor rate I mentioned, and by coincidence, about two hundred and fifty bucks per year is the uh, typical average charge for a street light. And so, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, there's, uh, there's, there's a lot of good reasons, as Ken said, for you to never do that uh, and to always, as Ken said, uh, change your, I think, I think Ken, that's usually an ordinance change that most cities uh, do, uh, but, but yes, absolutely. That, that is the million dollar question. Great, you guys, thank you so much. So that is our last question. Um, so I do want to go ahead and, and uh, say thank you to Dave, Paul, and Ken for providing us with this information today. Uh, you guys provided a lot of great information for our members. Just a reminder, if anyone does have any topics related to equity and diversity, 
and you would like to share them with CML, please send them to cml at cml.org or you could visit our website at www.cml.org slash equity to see what we have on our resource page. Uh, again, this information or this webinar has been recorded and we will be posting it to our website by the end of this week, along with the PowerPoint. And you'll be able to find that at www.cml.org <laughs> under training materials. Uh, gentlemen, thank you again. And at this point, I would like to say that this concludes our uh, webinar and I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Courtney.